Got so, it. All right. So it says we are live, and here we are. I am joined by another long-standing podcast companion, Renal Wadwa. How are you doing? Very good, John. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad that you're willing to submit yourself to this uh, experimental interactive format uh, for the audience. Uh, you know what you got to do here. You got to chime in and uh, start start giving us uh, feedback and grief. Um, and uh, we will uh, be going through some countdowns today. We're going to talk IoT project success, and this is really important. I think. I mean, obviously, IoT is a buzzword you can take or leave. That doesn't really matter. The point is connected devices, smart devices, all that stuff. That's an enterprise reality now, right, Renal? And we got to do it right, not screw it up. It's happening, right? Whether we like it or not, we call it, we may, you know, we may give it all sorts of names. There's the the super popular Twitter had, handle, the Internet of Shit, right? It's uh, right. regardless of what we call it, right? It's happening. It's um, uh, the phys- things around us in the physical world are getting digitized. There's value in doing it, both for con- convenience of consumers um, and for helping businesses save money, make safer environments, improve, uh, reduce costs, all of that. Right. So it's, it's happening. Yeah. And I think, I think in, we're going to do countdowns. You're going to get a chance to vent on the IOT stuff that drives you a little crazy. Um, I might participate a little bit, but full disclosure to the listeners, I've had a ridiculous week because my beloved car died and I've spent a lot of time in the car dealership this week and not preparing for this show. So, but we're, we're going to, we're going to be counting down what bothers Renal most around IOT misconceptions. And we're also going to get into project success because one of the, one of the things I'm really trying to do with this rebooted show is to strike a good balance between kind of taking some shots at, at stuff that needs to be demystified, but also uh, really looking at, at what it takes to pull off successful projects. Cause that's really why we're all, we're all here at the, and um, we need to we need to sort of have a positive tip, and I think that's the one I want to take. Um, I, th- I think with IoT, it's interesting because we could get into we could get sidetracked by consumer IoT, and obviously hackable consumer devices make headlines just about every day. Uh, mm-hmm. So we could touch on that, but that's not really going to be our our main focus. We're going to look more at the enterprise side of this. Um, I um, we're going to talk a little about your startup. Uh, um, we're going to save some of that to the end because if you can make it without pimping your startup too much, I'll give you a shameless plug at the end. Um, but but I do want to talk about it a little bit because I want our viewers to understand the background that you bring to this because you're not just coming in as like, oh, I'm I'm a newfangled I- IoT dude like tr- trying to make a big startup. Like you you have a background in in enterprise software and you've worked on a ton of SAP projects, so you kind of know you have this history of, of large scale products. You know how products get into trouble with security and all that stuff. So tell, tell the viewers a little bit about your background and kind of what, how you wound up in this space. Yeah. So um, I have been involved in building large scale distributed systems throughout my career uh, at various enterprise companies, started at EMC, then was at SAP for some time. Um, then did a bunch of consulting work around the big data Hadoop space. Uh, and then about, uh, I want to say about eight years ago or seven or eight years ago, um, I got deeply involved with IoT, uh, because I was hired into a business that was a traditional, um, hardware company. They'd been building hardware since the nineties and they wanted to transform their business from being a vendor of devices and sensors into a, uh, a platform for connected cities. And that was a really interesting experience for me. I was brought in as CTO to kind of lead that sort of transformation uh, of that business. And um, uh, we ended up designing a IoT platform. The term IoT platform kind of didn't exist when we started. Uh, so everything was was new. We designed a platform. We then deployed large number of sensors in several major city downtowns. Um, and had all sorts of pains and experiences um, in doing that. But these were systems that were doing, you know, critical city infrastructure. So things like flood monitoring, traffic monitoring, uh, streetlight control, et cetera, that, that are both cost savers and 
uh, ways for cities to make the experience of people living in the cities better. Um, in deploying and designing those systems, um, I have formed a strong view around why IoT projects fail, uh, how IoT projects may be successful or could be successful, um, and of course, things like security, scale, reliability, dependability of systems like this. So that's that's why I'm here. And now I, um, about two years ago, joined my co-founder, Matt Gregory, in this open source startup. Uh, we're 100% open source code base. Uh, the company's called Occam, and we're building some tools to make um, IoT secure and safe. Because no, uh, no IT manager is going to sign off on any of any of this stuff without that. So, got to have it. So yeah, I think that. You know, go, go ahead, John. No, you first. So uh, I think the, uh, you know, in simple terms, right? A project is successful if it meets accept expectations, right? A customer gives you money, and they have some expectations, and they expect the project to meet those expectations. And some some of those expectations are kind of explicit and stated, like, hey, you know, you should be able to do this, right? You should be able to measure, uh, you should be able to detect when my machine's about to break down, or you should be able to detect when my pressure has reached a certain level, right? Um, those are explicit ones. But then there's always these implicit expectations. Even though the customer didn't say it, they expect that your, your cool new you know, gadget isn't going to disrupt operations in their company, right? They expect that that thing is not going to expose them to uh, ransomware or malware or uh, downtime for for a week, right? Um, so a project to be successful needs to meet these expectations. And something's clearly wrong in IoT, because I don't know what the latest number is, but from McKinsey and others, there have been these numbers of, you know, 75% of IoT projects fail, right? Well, that's a ridiculously bad number. And um, uh, something's not right. And I'm really curious about what others think as well around um, how to fix it, but I certainly have strong opinions on the approach. Yeah, let's definitely get further into why why IoT projects fail and and how to avoid such types of scrutiny. Um, and I also want to get into what the winning business models are because ultimately this should be a business conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll get into that as well. Uh, for our for our first countdown, we're going to be doing your, your top four misconceptions about IoT. I think a lot of them are around security, but you can take it wherever you want. Um, give us, give us number four. What, 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 what misconception about IOT drives you nuts? Um, I see. Uh, my system is secure because I'm using blockchain. I'll start there. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. All right. We're it already in a block. We're already in a blockchain. This is good. This is good. My attempt there. My my hope there is that we can kind of bury this one on the side, right? Blockchain's a tool. It's useful for something. We're still discovering what it might be good for, but it's a simple tool. It's a database that multiple people manage. And yes, there's a lot of technology technicality around what is the guarantee you can, what exact security guarantee you could design into that design of that distributed system that a lot of people manage together. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a table that to edit it, three out of five parties have to agree before you can edit it, right? They have to agree on the rules of when you're allowed to edit a, a, a row in that table. And that is a useful tool. It is not a, not a panacea to solve the world's problems. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a useful tool in some small subset of applications, for instance, in the IoT realm, uh, certain people are looking at, or, or even our company has looked at in the past around designing uh, a table which stores identity and public keys of devices in a shared manner. Because that's an important that's an important um, uh, data point that if only one party is managing that table, 
that one party can override that entry in the table and override some device's identity or some person's identity. So in certain small subset of use cases like currency, like identity, there is some applications. But just saying my I use the blockchain so my IoT system is secure is just a weird distraction and we should all just ignore it. Yeah, it kind of seems like, I mean, I'm glad you brought up blockchain because it's certainly a pet peeve of mine as far as the amount of hype, but it seems like a distraction, right? Because we're trying to settle this issue of how revolutionary blockchain is. And it's the wrong conversation in the first place because we should never begin these project conversations with, I want to try a sexy tool out. You know, We should begin these conversations with what problem are we trying to solve? And then what tools work for that problem, it really going to vary, right? And look, I mean, if, if I have to fast forward a number of years, I think blockchain will have a, a use as one tool in a toolkit for things that that enterprises want to do, along with other distributed ledgers and very, you know, there's so many variations that are going to merge, I think. Um, so you're going to have to understand the use cases and, and a lot of them are very nuanced. So to me, it's like, well, okay, let's just... Put, I agree with you. I mean, it's it's fun to talk about blockchain because everyone's got an opinion. And hey, if anyone watching wants to throw out their blockchain opinions, you're welcome to do it. But I, I don't think that should be our focus because that's not what these products are really about. So, Yeah. And you know what's a cooler tool? Cryptography. Cryptography, mm -hmm. the field, which blockchain is just one, one use of cryptography. Cryptography as a whole is a much cooler tool. <laughs> Uh, if if we were if I was just geeking out and saying which tools to apply to IoT, that's the more interesting tool than you know one one interesting way of organizing database tables. Right, absolutely. Okay, cool. So uh, let's let's go on to your uh, your number three. What's what's another misconception that you run into that that makes your life harder? Uh, well, my life's all around IoT security, so I I hit a lot of these yep. um, these um, security related ones. Um, so every everyone will tell you their system is secure, right? And I, so let me let me explain what I mean. Uh, because IoT security is such a big objection that everyone every customer raises it. Uh, most vendors in their very first sentence will tell you their system is secure by design, right? Um, and so, so everyone's saying their system is secure, which means all of IoT is secure. Yet, um, you know, my news feed is pretty much every day several problems in IoT. Like the latest one was just yesterday, GE, uh, had several uh, radiology equipment with some default password or something like that, right? So it's all over the place. Clearly, IoT isn't secure, um, but the entire vendor ecosystem is out in the world saying, our stuff is secure by design. Uh, and that's definitely a pet peeve of mine, because if you scratch the surface in most of those scenarios, you find that things are... Um, things are bad. They're bad for a reason because it's challenging, right? The, that problem is pretty challenging to solve um, because, because the traditional tools that we've used for internet security don't necessarily just translate over to mm -hmm. IoT security. It's a new set of problems, a new set of threats, um, which needs a new set of solutions designed to address those threats. Um, and we have not reached that level of maturity yet um, as an ecosystem. Yeah, I was thinking you might be bringing up some of the uh, the edge hype too. It seems like now, now you're, it used to be you're cool if you're in the cloud. Now you're cool if you're on the edge. Um, but what, what does that actually mean? <laughs> we'll, we'll take your stuff on the edge, it's everything's running on the edge, right? That's the, that's my snarky. Uh, like I, I, I sit through several presentations every week, which are all about being on the edge. Um, so yeah, 
All right. Well, here's here's my view of it, right? The reality is it's happening. It kind of makes sense uh, to not compute everything at a central place. Uh, right. It makes sense to distribute decisions out to the world because what you get out of that is lower latency. Um, you get faster decisions. You can also get better context because um, you can have more sort of real-time context when you're taking that decision. And there's an opposite benefit to the cloud where you can have more historical context, more broader context across multiple machines, right? So, um, you know, IoT systems or edge systems are doing three things at a high level. They're, they sense, they infer, and then they act on whatever inference they arrived at, right? And um, it started out with, a lot of IoT started out with, well, actually, before before it became internet connected, the machine started out with doing all three things inside mm -hmm. a tiny microcontroller, and there was no connectivity, right? Sense in, in for an act was inside the microcontroller, no connectivity to the world. And that worked, but we learned that it wasn't very precise. It couldn't apply broader context, right? Because it was this isolated, tiny machine. Um, so then with IoT, over the last 10, 15 years, we realized, well, if we take this data and we send it to the cloud, to some central place where we can have a large database of context and business rules and machine learning models, we can improve accuracy. We can improve timeliness of decisions. Um, we can improve uh, like the basis of a decision itself. So it kind of makes sense. And, and so we started moving all, everything to the cloud. But that led to other problems around well, now latency is too high for a lot of use cases, and um, right. the um, uh, security obviously becomes a problem because you're now that data, that information is traveling over the network and can be tampered along the way. Instructions are traveling over the network, so if an instruction is tampered, your device could right. behave in weird ways, right? So yes, it kind of makes sense to now do it over the cloud. And this whole edge computing idea is well, okay, now to reduce latency, let's move these inferences closer to where the sense and act is happening, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes sense to me. It it leads to, um, I think, better systems in a lot of contexts. So that move is happening, but it's not, you know, a lot of the picture that is painted around edge computing is very sort of general purpose. You know, we'll move containerized workloads to the edge. Um, and it's not very clear for what applications. I think the I think I think a lot of this edge computing discussion needs to be done in the context of specific applications. Kind of, it makes sense to do it, for example, in transport transportation and autonomous driving. It makes sense to do it to improve accuracy of sensors. Um, so it's like like all buzzwords, there is there is some value in there, but a lot of the mar you know the the market buzz is is very fuzzy and not very coherent as usual. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about this other uh, buzz thing that drives me nuts is um, 5G because um, in the US, the telecoms are like like bombarding consumers with, with basically nonsense about 5G that doesn't even match up with the infrastructure we currently have. But but do you think in the context of some of these industrial use cases that 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 five G type of broadband upgrade makes a difference for some of these edge scenarios or or is it kind of like not a big deal in the evolution of things? Um, I think it may be right. A lot of so, so we talk about these big picture items like edge computing or you know everything will be connected through IP addresses, et cetera. The reality of a lot of IoT is that it's kind of stuck at step one. And all of these pictures that get painted in marketing material are step 95. And mm. we're not, we're, you know, most IoT is in POCs and just never gets out of POCs. So right. connectivity, uh, like all of that 75% of projects fail is most IoT just like, you know, you, you is, um, 
you know, some some team with a bunch of Raspberry Pis hacked together a tiny proof of concept, and then that thing never became real, right? That's the reality. Mm. So yes, in it, if a lot of things come together, um, uh, better connectivity is definitely a valuable thing when it comes to scalability of some of these solutions. And there is, in fact, better connectivity in I, I don't know if they if they have covered uh, NB-IoT specs under the 5G umbrella, but if they have, that is an interesting protocol. It has some very, very cool um, mm. applications, uh, but so do other alternatives to that protocol like LoRaWAN or um, Sigfox, right? There are lots of alternatives there, uh, but I think the bigger, the reason those conversations, at least in the IoT context, um, don't get me interested and I suspect don't even get end customers interested anymore is because they've now seen the reality of which is, you know, projects just don't get started. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they don't like, you know, sure you, you did a cool POC and you made a good presentation to some conference, but that's where things are stalled for a lot of IOT in the real world. Right. Got it. So if you're if you're stopping in now, um, talking with Emran all about IoT misconceptions and project success, the chat is a little quiet today. So I don't know if you guys are goofing off on holiday shopping, but it's time to start chiming in and keeping me on my toes with the questions. Um, but in the meantime, I'm I'm not never short of things to ask Ronald, especially in such an overhyped area. Um, I I we're gonna get back to our countdown of your misconceptions um but before we do i just want to ask you a little bit more Ooh, we got a linkedin user yeah he's one of our favorites our 5g iot devices fitted with e-sim cards open for local mobile networks are they available now hmm i don't know i don't um, think, i don't think i don't think we're all selling those currently but <laughs> I, I haven't seen one. I have seen sep- definitely prototypes of um, various sort of NBIOT like uh, systems, uh, but I haven't seen anything. Um, but I'm sure there are others uh, listening in that might have better context there. I haven't seen one that's available. Uh, by the way, this LinkedIn user uh, is staying up late for a show. Thanks for staying up late. I know you're on a different time zone. Uh, and sorry, the last week's show was even later. Uh, had uh, something I couldn't get out of. So anyhow, we, we moved it back to at least an earlier time for you. So good to see you back. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you a little more about IOT project failure, because when I see failure rates that are that high, it's, it's actually, look, I mean, a lot of failure rates in a lot of technology areas are pretty high, but it is a little bit concerning and it just want to make sure like, I don't think it's that the tech is not mature enough because I think a lot of this tech, putting blockchain aside, I think a lot of this other che- tech is mature enough. So if the tech's mature enough, then what what are the cause of these failures in your opinion? Yeah, uh, I, I really like the comment someone left around fridges and food. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Agree. Remember when um, he introduced us as fridges that can order your food automatically? Well, yeah, and, and um, who can forget Mark Benioff's smart toothbrush, right? Um, I mean, we haven't even gotten into smart devices uh, and and the consumer impact of those and the hackability because that's not going to be our focus today. But uh, but it does lend lend itself into the hype of the conversation for sure. Anyway, I have some. I have four smart toothbrushes, by the way, that I've not opened because because okay. um, our because our dental insurance that we have at the company, uh, they will mail you one for free. And essentially, mm-hmm. what they wanted to do is one. They want you to tell them how many times you brushed your teeth. And I have not opened even one of them, but I do have them somewhere lying around. Anyway. I think it'd be uh, pretty are, I think it'd be pretty it'd be pretty scary if you came home one night and they were talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> then then you but, would really then they would really pass the intelligence test. But anyhow, um back back to the failure. What so, what do you think yeah, is the a- source of that? So I, here's what I think, right? I think that um, we made we made uh, it really easy, or the community as a whole, over the last 10 to 12 years, it became really easy 
to prototype IoT products, right? The Raspberry came, Raspberry Pi came around, Arduinos came around. Um, these were tools that made it really easy to build a prototype of, of an internet connected device. Um, and that saw this renaissance of people thinking about use cases and trying to apply and imagining up things like, you know, connected refrigerators, et cetera, uh, or toothbrushes. And they could even put together a prototype pretty quickly and they could get things into production pretty quickly. But these fundamental, what, what I have seen happen in real world projects is that they, the POC, POC goes, goes pretty well. Uh, but when the customers start asking questions about like real world, you know, can my business depend on this solution that you're selling me? That's where things fall apart, right? Because the moment they start asking questions around dependability on these or depending on these systems, then the things get real, right? Then they'll ask questions about, well, you know, how do I scale this to if I'm if I'm doing truck monitoring and I'm monitoring my trucks for um, uh, for, um, you know, whether they're operational or not, uh, how can I scale this to a fleet of uh, 10,000 trucks? Um, and then that's where things start to fall apart because the tooling to uh, take that prototype and deploy it at large scale is still not quite ready, uh, especially deploying it in a, in, at large scale in a way that is dependable. And my definition of dependable is reliable in extreme conditions, um, secure, private, ex- you know, doesn't reveal my proprietary information, et cetera. So you, th- that's so you think, are. so you think there is a tooling issue that's, that's holding some of these projects back then? Yeah, I absolutely think so. I think the, I think, um, and, um, and that's where a, a lot of times what happens is that people will take tools they know. So because it got easier to prototype IoT, we saw this influx of traditional web app systems people or systems integrators in the enterprise now became suddenly I'm working on an IoT project now, right? And um, that cohort of people brings a lot of expertise around how to collect data, how to analyze data, how to run processes, et cetera. That's their, their core expertise, but they're unable to make these real when faced with these real world challenges of you know my device is sitting on the street or it's sitting inside a truck anyone has there's no data center boundary around it anyone that one has access to it how does that break my system those kinds of challenges um uh, are very different class of challenges uh, that that community isn't quite uh, prepared for and so how do you address that is you address that by some experts taking what they've learned and turning them into tools that are reusable and that democratize, you know, scaling of IoT systems uh, Mm. for these large community of developers that want to build systems. Makes sense. Any insight into medical health devices that could share data with clinical trials? Data with clinical trials. Um, I, I... so uh, there are lots of use cases. I don't know if you're talking about from a use case standpoint. I think there's uh, there's plenty of people exploring those kinds of use cases uh, around medical data. Um, it is definitely an area where security and privacy is critical. Um, even the most cutting edge of designs around IoT security um, in the medical setting can be very it not sufficient. Um, mm-hmm. So um, I'll take a very simple example, right? Let's say let's say I my, I have a connected watch, right? And this watch can connect my heart rate reading. And let's say my use case is that I should be able to see my heart rate reading on my phone. And they can't the when when the company sells me this this device, they go, yeah. So look, you can you can see your history of heart rate readings on your phone and um no one else can see it and you know you you can monitor your heart rates and uh, detect health based on it but the reality is that the company that sold me the device can see all of that data and there isn't a good technical design yet that would allow that company to offer this service 
without revealing the data to their servers. And the reality is that the infrastructure that is typically that typically goes behind all of this, um, it's not only one company, it's like several related partner businesses can all kind of see your data. And so very quickly you end up in this, you know, my my vulnerability surface is so large that nothing can be controlled. And so everything starts to leak. And then they go, okay, another cooler use case would be that if you could reveal this heart rate data to your doctors, that would be very nice, right? And now suddenly the hospital's ecosystem of developers and partners, everybody also is now part of this cohort of people that can start seeing your data, right? So um, the... Um, while a lot of people are experimenting with use cases, my personal experience has been that the, the infrastructure and tooling needed to address that isn't quite mature. A real solution that would be secure and private would be that uh, data from my health device comes end-to-end -end encrypted to me and no one else has the keys to see it. Mm -hmm. And the, the protocol can prove to me, at least to experts, that this, this cannot be exposed to anyone, right? And then when I reveal it to my doctor, the protocols underneath ensure that the only party I'm revealing to is my doctor and not some ecosystem of partners that can see, um, you know, the doctor's uh, patient data. Bottom line, healthcare scenarios aren't ready yet. Let's let's uh, avoid those. Uh, use healthcare data sharing uh, with extreme caution. And on we go to the countdown. We're still, we're, we're moving a little slowly through the material here, but that's okay. Uh, so uh, number, number two misconception from you uh, that bothers you about IOT. Um, so uh, since I'm continuing down the security rabbit hole, I'll, I'll continue down that, that path. Um, so the, um, What's very common, and I kind of alluded to this already, what's very common is that um, uh, customers will, or, or vendors will say, our IoT system is secure because we use HTTPS. Um, and this is a symptom of uh, not understanding how, um, how some of these, what, in what threat model a particular protocol was designed for. HTTPS was designed for um, a very different kind of system from IoT, right? So HTTP is designed for securing the web, um, and um, it it only authenticates the server, and the server authentication mechanism is also reliant on a tree of trusted parties uh, called your certificate authority tree, right? Or the web PKI. And um, that infrastructure works in browsers uh, to authenticate servers. It doesn't work in a device to authenticate something. You could make it work to authenticate servers, but actually most device and server communication is two-way communication, right? So even the simplest sensor that is sending some sense data to a server um, will have a mechanism to receive a software update. So it's always bi-directional mm -hmm. communication. And because it's always bi-directional communication, you need mutual authentication in all these systems you design. Right. To have mutual authentication, uh, that's where the problems get really bad because you have, hey, I have, um, uh, I have, um, one server and I have a hundred thousand devices. So to have authentication, I need to store secrets in a hundred thousand devices. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that only that one device can prove to me that it's that device. And that's where things get the worst, right? That's the root cause of IoT security problems, which is key management at scale. Right. Uh, distribution of keys, rotation of keys, revocation of keys, all of those are the real world problems. So what happens is a lot of uh, vendors, customers that I've come across, well, they'll, they'll kind of convince themselves that they, their system is secure 
because it uses HTTPS, because that's the advice that a lot of people have been sort of echoing in the web world is if you want a website that is secure, use HTTPS. But you don't get a secure IoT device just because you started started using HTTPS. You got a little kudo there. That explanation of HTTPS is one of the best I've heard. Well, why do you think okay. I had Renal on the program, dude? Guy knows what he's talking about. Um, there were a bunch okay. of other comments. I don't know if I missed Yeah, them. yeah. I don't want to get into all of them because, frankly, we're going back to blockchain, and we already dispensed with blockchain earlier. Um, we're not going to be talking about uh, blockchain much more on today's program. Sorry. It's an immature technology. It's not ready for this yet. But anyway, what if you could store a trial volunteer database and use blockchain to anonymize the source personal identifiable data? Uh, can you dispense with this fairly quickly so we can move on? Because I just, sorry, I just don't want to get into blockchain again. A blockchain does not do anonymization. A blockchain is simply a table that multiple parties are managing. And right. it has nothing that helps with anonymization. You could use cryptography to anonymize. And this is where I actually have a good example. Um, so uh, recently in the news was, you know, the Google, Apple, uh, COVID uh, exposure notification protocol. That is actually a really good protocol. Um, and it uses cryptography to solve some problems, not all problems with that use case, but some problems of privacy and security in that use case. And I hope to see more such cryptography-enabled protocols to become popular. Uh, you know, uh, to give a simple example, the COVID protocol is really complex, but to give a simple example, uh, Apple has a protocol called Find My. Uh, which allows you to find a lost device, right? So if you lose your Apple phone, and the, you can look it up on a map and it'll tell you that someone else saw your phone in the park. Uh, how does it come up with that information? Is that when the phone is lost in the park, it starts transmitting a public cryptographic key over a Bluetooth. And nearby devices capture that key. They take their location and encrypt it for that key and upload it to Apple servers. And now you can discover it. But what's the nuance? The nuance is that in that model, Apple servers are not tracking your location at all times. Mm. Versus you take the same solution from, you know, one of these tile vendors that sell you these tiles that you can attach to your backpack or a phone, or even from Google, the same solution of help me find my lost device results in Google or tile or whoever tracking your the location of your device at all times. So cryptography is a very cool tool for us to build protocols that fundamentally, computationally guarantee that this information is not revealed um, mm -hmm. and still deliver these use cases. So uh, cryptographic protocols, I am a huge proponent of, and our company that we'll talk about later is actually investing a lot into building systems like that. Uh, but a lot of times, because blockchain was a use case of novel cryptography, people conflate what blockchain can do with what cryptography in general can do. Um, and blockchain cannot anonymize. Cryptography, if used correctly, could help with anonymization of certain data. Yeah, and then there's um, there's the comment around like... Um, then you could reward users via micropayments on how their data is analyzed. I don't want to get into that now, but I do. I will say that um, on the on the consumer side of these things, absolutely, absolutely, I think I think um, proper compensation for use of data is uh, a valuable and underused tactic and needs to be more prevalent going can forward I, as opposed to advertising based. Can I say something about that? Right. So before yeah, yeah. that happened, before that vision of you know people should get paid for use of their data can even be realized. People need control over what data about them is being used or can be used. Right. And current designs of systems don't have that control. So the, uh, you know, in, in security, there's this law, you know, back in the 80s, there was this principle introduced or 70s maybe uh, called the principle of least privilege. That's what Unix security is designed on. 
The idea is, or in, in military circles, they use the term need to know, right? Only reveal information to whoever needs to know that information. It's like a basic fundamental principle in security. Um, cryptography and encryption is our only tool to build that control. Um, if you don't have cryptography and encryption, what you have is a system where everybody can see uh, or manipulate everything, all pieces of information that are flowing in the system. So by using cryptography and things like end-to-end -end encryption and mutual authentication, what we get is control over who should see what data. And then from that, we can build control over, okay, if I am revealing my data to John, I'm going to reveal it only when John pays me for it. But if I don't have that control, then there's no way we're going to get to a world where I get paid for use of my data, right? Yep. One more comment here. Uh, he agrees completely trying to understand the link of blockchain and cryptography, but okay, we can stop this conversation to move on. Thanks for that because we are going to stop this conversation to move on. Uh, you'll find Mernal's an accessible fellow, so I'm sure uh, given your know-how, I'm sure you guys could have an interesting mutual conversation about that at some point. Um, and I don't mean to give it short shrift here. It's just that I have some other things I really want to talk with Mernal about because we really wanted to focus a little bit on IT, IoT project success in the enterprise space. So I want to get there. Um, okay, let's get your fi final misconception out of the way. Let's run through that pretty quick. You have one more, right? I have in all of this forgotten what my list was. Uh, what did I have up there? Oh, yeah. Number one has the number one I had was, well, I don't need IoT security. It's just a bunch of sensors, right? It's <laughs> out there. It's fine if they send me. I, I, you would be surprised how many times I come across this, right? So what people are saying is, it's just some input information. Uh, why do I care if it's secure? Well, you mm -hmm. care if it's secure because you, you know, like if you're doing something valuable with it, if that system isn't secure, what you're getting is garbage and you're, what you're producing is also garbage. So what's the point, right? The, mm -hmm. the, it's, it, you know, the, um, in 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 security circles, there's this problem called the Sybil the the Sybil attack, right? Which is that if you can't authenticate what where a piece of information came from, that remote party could be replicated by, with millions of uh, spoofed replicas, and they would all look like information that originated at your source, right? So if your only authentication of your sensor is its IP address or its MAC address or some UUID that you gave it or some name that you gave that sensor, then uh, if your use case is valuable and useful, there is motivation for someone to spoof that thing. And right. when they do that, um, you have garbage. Um, more so, those sensors may need software updates. So you end up adding you know, some kind of uh, software update mechanism to it. And so your, your thing has, uh, you know, a username and password. And suddenly that thing is an attractive machine to convert into a botnet participant. And that's how you end up with, you know, malwares and ransomwares, et cetera. Yep. So even if you have a sensor and it's just a sensor, if it doesn't do security, uh, you're probably going to end up in some trouble because of it if you leave it running for a while yeah and and my my number one would have to be and we're not going to spend time on this because i want to move on but would have to be I, I think we need a much higher bar for when we use the phrase smart device i i think smart should be a high standard not something you can throw around on on any p on any toothbrush and refrigerator um in my opinion smart implies the ability to learn if 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 you can't learn, I don't see how you're smart. I think you're just connected to the internet. That's different. It's totally different. Anyway, just a personal issue that I have. <laughs> but uh, if any of you guys have IoT misconceptions and buzzwords that are bothering you, please throw them into the chat. Um, but I, I actually want to get into your keys for success. But I, I wanted to ask you about sort of killer apps is the wrong phrase, but like in terms of industrial IoT, what use cases do you think are are most compelling right now? I mean, the one that always jumps out to me uh, is predictive maintenance, just because mm -hmm. uh, you know you have equipment, and especially in the COVID area, 
that's very, very difficult to supervise and, and also to fix. Whenever I do tours of shop floors and stuff like that, there's invariably a huge expensive and usually about 20 year old piece of equipment that's that's worth like more money than like everything I own. And and if it goes down, they're they're screwed. And 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 very few of those machines are are connected to anything and have any kind of predictive. And and in my mind, when I talk with those folks, they're always super interested, but they're not like there yet. But so that's one use case that jumps out at me. But I'm curious from your perspective, where where do you see the real action as far as what can be done today? So yeah, I I think predictive maintenance is definitely, if not the top one of the top few use cases in enterprise scenarios. Um, and it is incredibly valuable because it, um, it, it prevents downtime. It can lead to, you know, lowered maintenance costs. Uh, it can increase the longevity of that super important asset that uh, people typically have. Um, I had a really cool story of predictive maintenance. I think on Tom Rafferty's, uh, digital supply chain block, uh, podcast, um, but he was talking to someone from, I don't know which company they were from, but they told about uh, trains and this company that was making, that makes the wheels, the steel wheels of trains. And um, the traditional approach to maintenance is, um, you know, check the wheels at some set period periodicity after every trip of the train, et cetera, right? And you check whether they're okay. And if they're if they look okay, you you keep the train running. But that leads to sort of unexpected downtimes, right? Because the load of every train is not the same. The the length that every train uh, travels is not the same or every wheel deals with is not the same. So there's so much variance in how much stress each wheel is exposed to that you can't possibly get a good uh, maintenance out of, you know, just doing it at a set frequency. If you flip that to detection, and so that's this company that he was talking to, or this person he was talking to was describing how they were measuring uh, flexion and torsion of the wheels and detecting cracks, um, you can then kind of just in time respond to uh, these scenarios. You can even predict that, okay, in these many miles, I will not be able to operate on this wheel anymore. And you can kind of react to that, right? So um, what, the, what the impact of all of that is uh, you don't have um, uh, you don't have downtimes. You can plan when you need maintenance. You can pro react to, you know, as things are building up to a downtime, like a train stopping or something, you can proactively take measures to avoid that situation. So like it's it's it, what I, what I liked about that example was it was literally the get the trains running on time example. Uh, so uh, right. I thought that that's, that metaphor kind of applies to a lot of um, industrial equipment, whether it's like a CNC machine at a company or it's you know a pressure pump or or something. There's a lot of uh, maintenance related scenarios that make a lot of sense, um, and. Another thing that's interesting there is that the um, the return on investment is really easy to conceptualize and visualize in enterprise scenarios versus consumer scenarios, right? So in consumer scenarios, the uh, the cost of a connected device is um, let's say five times the cost of an unconnected version of that device, right? If I buy a connected lock, I might pay five times more, ten times more sometimes versus a dumb lock, right? And so the return on investment on that lock is very hard to visualize uh, for an end consumer, right? Because is it so much better to get a connected lock? Uh, maybe not, right? Uh, but in an enterprise setting, especially these maintenance use cases, the return on investment typically becomes really easy to kind of justify. And um, so I think that maintenance is an awesome one. Another use case that I, in recent times, I think is gaining a lot of traction is sort of remote monitoring of status of things, right? So mm -hmm. instead of people uh, people having to visit to check on status and to, in, to do an inspection uh, for, for maintenance purposes, et cetera, they can do those things remotely. Uh, and that's a pretty use case, a cool use case. In manufacturing, there's also a lot of um, uh, a lot of like uh, robotic arm type things that are now starting 
uh, to get connected. And the difference is they, there were robotic arms since the 80s. I think 80s or 90s, people have been doing some amount of automation with, with arms of some kind, right? Uh, but what's nice about connecting them is you can improve their precision and you can apply them in better scenarios. So mm. if you connect them, you can apply machine learning uh, to historical information. So if a if a arm mm. is making decisions based on vision data, you can improve the accuracy of that vision data. So you might have like an industrial setting, you might have, you know, uh, a, a robot picking up boxes and placing them on pellets. Um, where if you add vision to it and you add machine learning to it, you can turn that into the robot can decide which boxes to place in which sections in which pellets, right? And that makes right. a whole lot of difference in terms of like applicability of those use cases. Um, so yeah, so um, maintenance definitely at the, predict maintenance definitely at the forefront of these use cases, but um, there are all sorts of use cases around automation and uh, even failure detection, those kinds of things. By the way, I like your use of the word connected because I like that much better than smart. Um, for a lot of these devices, I think connected devices is a better terminology that is more real for what it is. Uh, we had that comment. I just put it up on the screen for a minute because it blocks our entire faces. But <laughs> but but it's uh, the analogy of airplane en engine maintenance, where during this time there are opportunities to maintain airplane engines, which you will know has improved hugely with using tools and robots to fix issues with engines that would previously require months of effort. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so uh, we we want to go through your keys to successful IoT projects, and we won't probably be able to get to all of them in our remaining time, but we'll definitely want to get to a few of them. And one thing I did want to mention that's on my mind, because you brought it up in a few times, I think, in, in these examples, um, and one of the real disappointments, I think, around like not getting past the POC phase is to me – it's it's the data platform that starts to make these things exciting, right? So, to to your point, being able to pull data from all these devices, uh, you know, do exception handling scenarios, uh, apply machine learning and predictive trends. So, it to me, like the more you're thinking in a data platform context about these projects, the better off you're going to be in the long run versus just an isolated POC in one factory, for example, or in one project setting. So, yeah, absolutely. I don't, know if, and I don't know if that made I don't know if that made your list, but that would be on my list. So, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think it's the it's this you know what is the business trying to achieve, right? What is what yeah. what is tangible improvement um, in our current way of doing business uh, yeah. that may be enabled by this IoT use case um, or even smart connected device use case, right? Uh, uh -huh. they, there is definitely an opportunity to mix. Um, uh, learning type of models with uh, just pure connectivity, but you get right. plenty of value just from pure connectivity, right? So it's not just it's sure. because even if it's pure connectivity, the the amount of information a single device has is significantly smaller than the amount of information a collection of similar devices may have, right? So even if you're not applying any kind of machine learning, you get more context. You more you get you may get more business context in a remote uh, like decision inference location uh, than inside the device. So connectivity itself can be very valuable, uh, but uh, adding the ability to learn based on inputs either from that device or devices around it or other contexts. Uh, can definitely be very valuable, but it uh, at the end of the day, it's all about what data am I collecting and what actions am I able to automate. And actually, I didn't mention this in my pet peeves, but one of the pet peeves about IoT is a lot of people just focus on the sensing aspect of IoT and forget about the actions aspect of IoT. Right? In my mind, it's mm -hmm. sense in for an act, and um, uh, even if you have a pure sensor, there are still some actions like applying the software update. So it's always sense in for an act. Um, and it's important to remember all three of them. But the act is about applying decisions and sense and infer is about making those decisions wisely with the right kind of information. And um, having the right data platform that can actually function in these environments where, yes, you want some of the computation to move to the edge. 
So how do you move your contextual data to the edge? How do you move learned models to the edge? Those are all important questions if you're going to build this smart ecosystem of connected products mm. uh, that are actually cool. smart. Absolutely. All right. So your keys to successful IoT projects. Why don't you have a look at your list for a moment there and see if there's any that we haven't touched on at all? Because I imagine we probably hit on a few of them during the conversation. Are there any that jump out that we haven't hit on? Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm looking at the list and I think I, because I talked about uh, uh, some of this, I think we touched on it. But here's the here's the general point. Right. We are. A lot of the marketing around IoT tends to pay tends to paint the step 100 picture or the step mm. 95 picture. The real world is still struggling with moving from step one to two, and um, and so that's why we are in this like POC hell, right? We have projects that can't scale beyond certain small POC settings. Uh, to change that. I think, well, of course, you know, there are experts in project management and um, um, better expectation management and helping customers understand all of this better. All of that is needed. Uh, but from a technology standpoint, since I'm the technology te uh, person in this discussion, I think from a technology standpoint, it's uh, it's important we get past certain very basic hurdles. Uh, the super basic one is, uh, you know, things should be uh, mutually authenticated. Uh, there is no way around that problem. There is things should be end-to-end -end encrypted. Otherwise, we don't have least privilege uh, being applied. Uh, there's no way around that problem, um, which means we need unique cryptographic keys in all devices. Again, no way around that problem. We have to provide easy tools that solve that. Um once you have unique keys and all sorts of devices, you have to be able to rotate those keys, revoke those keys, manage them like any secret, uh, like your password, right? You need to be able to change your password a few days, every few days or weeks or months. Otherwise, that password gets stolen and gets uh, uh, broken, right? So um, all of this is to say that traditional granular security authentication authorization controls aren't quite yet mature for IoT. Without that, we can't have secure IoT. And without secure IoT, we can't have IoT that is dependable. And I believe one of the reasons projects fail is this. There are, of course, other reasons, right? So uh, clearly my bias in this, in this is obviously um, clear in this conversation, but there are obviously other reasons around, you know, um, skills gaps, right? Which is, like a lot of these projects are SIs pulled in to execute some use case. So now SIs tend to have really good context about the business solution and they'll have good expertise around making the business solution, but they tend not to have the expertise needed for the IoT-ish aspects of it. They don't, they don't typically have a lot of hardware background. They don't understand radio networks. They don't understand security in IoT too much. And that's where they stumble, right? So you have you have this big high level picture and some block diagrams that show, you know, this is the cool integrated solution we will have, but it doesn't succeed because the the foundation uh, is weak. And I usually don't do uh, plugs for Diginomica articles during the conversation, but uh, if you do a search on Diginomica Pilot Purgatory, you'll find a really cool article from Anna Regard of Plex. Uh, it's called Manufacturers, This is How to Escape the Perils of Pilot Purgatory. And he gets into that point that you've been talking about, which I think is really important, which is you're getting stuck in these pilot phases and that's not working. So anyway, it's a really good discussion to have. We can't cover all of that today, unfortunately. Um, anything else you wanted to cover from your um, keys to IoT product success? Then we're going to give you a chance to talk a little bit about your company, but I want to Give you a chance to see if there's anything else you left out there. So, um, since I have, there is obviously a collection of things you need to get right to have a successful IoT project. But since I've spent right. the entire hour just focusing on the security aspect, I'll say that this 
to have good security, you have to have a good threat model. And this mm-hmm. is where things uh, typically fall apart, right? They don't even get started the right way. So the, 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 the idea of a threat model is that uh, there is a collection of things I consider as bad things in my system. I need to make a list of what is that collection of bad things. And any project in IoT, I think, should start with that because IoT security is well understood and well defined. If you're building a web app or a mobile app, you don't have to start with that because uh, that problem has been solved for you by someone else already. And it, it was a team of literally thousands of people solving uh, the and designing the threat models and things needed for TLS to work on the web, things needed for the public key infrastructure of the web to work, all of the things needed for browsers to work correctly, sandboxing, etc. All of these are solved problems. But in IoT, they are not solved problems, which means if you're getting started on an IoT project and you care that your system is dependable and to be dependable is secure uh, uh, and private, if you're targeting consumers especially, then uh, the very first thing I think you should start with is a threat model of what all can go bad in my system Mm. and what is my system doing to help me against those bad things. Um, That, I think, is key to having a successful IoT project. Cool. Uh, Before we get to your company part, we do have another comment. Uh, uh, Another scenario, the uh, speech-to-text and... Horrific Alexa, Siri, Google analysis. How do we turn that into IoT where someone asks something and the device understands what is being asked? The reason I held off on the question is because I wanted to focus a little bit on the enterprise project side of this, but we can do a quick answer to this one if you have any thoughts on that. So um, I have another scenario, speech to text, some horrific, how do we turn that into IoT or someone asks something and device understands what is being asked? Um, so, uh, but it has to be speech to text, but it could be speech to text in a better way than it currently is. And I think Apple Siri is actually doing some things in this area. I am not sure. Uh, but I know for sure Google and Microsoft, uh, Google and, uh, Alexa are not, Amazon are not. Um, but essentially there is a way to do machine learning in a federated way. And um, Google has applied that to um, uh, some of their applications. They have this whole uh, set of like comic series on um, TensorFlow Federated uh, that you should check out if you get a chance. TensorFlow is a framework to do machine learning by Google. But essentially, the use case they applied it to was uh, our, our keyboards on our phones learning uh, what we type. Right. So everyone types different things and we make up words and we type them. And so what Google wants to do is suggest you what you're about to type. One way to build that system is to collect everything I type. Another way to build that system is and then learn from that. Okay, 500 people type the same word. So for for the 500 first person, I will suggest the word when they type the first two letters. Right. That's how machine learning works. Um, if you collect all the data that everyone is typing, uh, similarly, if you collect all the data that everyone is saying, which is Alexa, Siri, and uh, uh, et cetera, then you create this honeypot of what everyone said in the world. And that has, of course, good and bad use cases, right? Uh, instead, yeah. if you flip that around and you learn, you still build the model of who, which words are being said often, but you learn... E- in the device and you only communicate the learned information and you don't communicate the raw data, Mm. you can still have the nice convenience of good autocorrection without everybody's, everything everyone said being collected. And Google has made it work with Google Keyboard. Uh, So one would argue that there is a potential to make it work for speech as well because the use case Mm -hmm. is exactly the same. Um, So... Um, I, I, I think that kind of like federated machine learning is a really good optimistic, uh, uh, area of research in this space. 
you're getting more uh, more props there. A great introduction of IoT Thank for you. me. Thank you so much. So, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think the nice thing about what we discussed today is there was a lot of background information, but we also got into some pretty advanced stuff in certain areas, too. So that was kind of a nice mix. Um, okay, you made it more than an hour without plugging your your startup and i'm gonna now give you the shameless plug opportunity uh what what part of all that we've been talking about today what what part are, is occam trying to solve okay so what we realize is uh, that there are there is clearly a tooling gap right um security privacy and trust are application layer concerns a application developer knows which piece of data should be exposed to which entity in my system, right? That's application layer knowledge. But our traditional means of doing security has been focused on the network layer. And applications are moving further and further away from the networking infrastructure. As more infrastructure gets virtualized, as more infrastructure moves to the cloud or even edge environments, the application developer has very little visibility into or control into what's going on in the network layer. And what that does is it creates this impedance mismatch, if you will. It's it's a mismatch between uh, how what should be secured, trusted, and private, and what the network topology is, right? So um, that's that's part of the reason a lot of systems are insecure. So one of the things we have done is build a open source collection of programming libraries that you can use to build an end-to-end -end encrypted communication channel at the application layer, regardless of the network topology. So if you're used to something like WhatsApp or Signal, where uh, if John and I are exchanging messages, the messages are end-to-end -end encrypted between John and me, and the server is just a router. Similarly, if I have a connected light switch in my house and I have a phone that's turning that light switch on, ideally, this trust should be end-to-end -end between my phone and the light switch. But re in reality, in most IoT systems, this trust is via some server. And the server can totally eliminate my phone out of the picture and the server could on its own turn the light on or off, which means that if the server is hacked, someone could control lights on and off in lots of houses. Uh, and that's not a good thing, right? Um, so by having end-to-end -end encryption in these systems, we bring back control. We bring back the principle of least privilege to IoT systems. And this topology is a very simple topology. Real-world IoT topologies can get really complex with lots of different networking protocols and lots of different uh, multiple hops of networks. And even in those scenarios, you don't want your data to be exposed to intermediaries in the network. You want end-to-end -end application layer trust and control. So that's layer one of the Occam solution, which is end-to-end -end encryption and end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. Layer two of the Occam solution is how do I deal with uh, unique cryptographic keys in all devices, mutual authentication in these end-to-end -end encrypted channels, uh, issuance of credentials, rotation of credentials, revocation of credentials. It's, it's identity and access management designed for IoT. Uh, rather than taking traditional identity and access management and trying to force fit into IoT, this is identity and access management designed specifically for what real world IoT looks like. And it's fully 100% open source and it's available as a collection of developer tools. The idea being that a lot of this cryptography that we are using to do this is very complex, but the APIs we expose to developers should be simple enough and misuse resistance. And um, just like they should just work. I should be able to call a function and say, create a secure channel with that light switch. I shouldn't have to figure out a bunch of complex cryptography to do that. Uh, so that's what we're enabling. We're enabling a very simple function that a developer can call to say, give me a secure channel to this other device or from this device, give me a secure channel to this enterprise service without all of the complexity that goes underneath in terms of creating that actual secure channel. Yeah, it's been fun to watch you guys evolve. You know, been speaking 
uh, to you for some time now. And uh, it seems like every time we talk, you get a more, you guys have a more kind of precise view of exactly what part of this you can tackle and how to do it, which is neat. So you've learned a lot. Yeah, well, yeah, we uh, we have learned a lot as well, right? And it's been obviously an exploration of essentially what we're taking is uh, trying to do is take complex cryptographic tools that have been proven to work in other settings. So we're not inventing this stuff, right? There's already right. proof points of a bunch of this working, right? Like end-to-end -end encryption in, in messaging gaps already works. So we're taking existing stuff, but we're applying it to the context of IoT and trying to um solve this collection of problems uh that go into making a successful iot solution uh without exposing the complexity involved in it to the to the application developer and uh if folks want to join your community and get involved in your open source initiatives they can do that off your homepage so occam.io join occam.io and GitHub, yes, that's that's the perfect place. Or we're we have a discussion board on GitHub. So GitHub.com slash Occam hyphen network slash Occam, and I'll post a link in chat so everyone has it. Oh, maybe I can't do yeah, that. Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you can. Um, I'll post a link to your website as well. Um, in yeah, our... and over there is you know check out the source code or GitHub. So if you find us on GitHub, that's the best place for for all conversations and. We are we are looking for use cases on how to build use cases where you're struggling with security problems, right? If you have an IoT solution mm -hmm. and you care about the security and reliability of that system, I, I would love to learn more about use cases and how and tell you about you know how how um, how these new protocols could be applied to those uh, those uh, situations. And yeah, there's. Uh question you may not want to answer today but uh how much do you charge for your knowledge a day for your knowledge and experience uh you want to issue well, some pricing guidelines or uh <laughs> well i at the moment i charge nothing just give you know ping me on twitter and we can we can chat um i am so yeah. hungry to talk to people with real world problems um so absolutely you know ping me and i'd love to learn about you, what you're doing, what kind of problems you're solving. Um, so nothing. I used to be a consultant, and at that point, I definitely did have a rate. But these days, right. I am I'm not. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a it's a it's a cool opportunity to to kind of build community around what you're doing, and then inevitably, project work stems from that over time. But I like that you're focusing on the community side because that's really what we need right now especially as you say around the developer communities around this stuff. So, yeah. And you know, it's um, uh, open source is a key sort of uh, um, value in the company we started. Uh, essentially we think that um, that's the only way to build a security centric product, right? There's mm -hmm. security by obscurity just doesn't work, right? Saying that my system, I'll just not tell how my stuff works and no one will discover the problems with it is just like it's an unproven technique. So the better approach is just to, hey, this is how our stuff works. This is what our designs look like. Uh, let's chat about what your problems are and let's see if we apply. And we're also pulling in, you know, cryptography experts and protocol design experts into the community and continuously getting feedback. We're also pulling in developers and tell us if this stuff is, is in fact easy. We want to make it easy, but is it easy? Uh, so. You know, all of that is uh, very useful in uh, open communities. So aside from getting uh, additional dialogue going on various use cases with people on projects, uh, what heading into this next year, what what um, questions are you trying to figure out? What 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 you you're a very intellectually vigorous person is trying to solve further problems. So what what's next on your mind? Um, so, um, you know, I, I'll share from Occam's perspective and personally. So Occam, sure. from Occam's perspective, um, the, the big thing ahead for us this coming year is, uh, integrations with partners. So we already announced one, uh, with InfluxDB, which is a time series, open source time series database, uh, just a few weeks ago. 
Uh, we're doing another announcement with microchip in, in a few weeks. Uh, they're a hardware, major hardware vendor. Um, and we're developing integrations with uh, Confluent and Kafka, and we're developing mm -hmm. integrations with Okta, the human identity focus yep. business. And so um, the next year for Occam is all about integrating into uh, existing right. enterprise infrastructure. We've built our thin layer that provides security, but we know that we can't exist in isolation. So our go-to-market strategy is all about uh, integration with uh, existing tools that IoT systems are already relying on. Um, so that's what next year is all about at Occam. Uh, lots of integrations. We call them add-ons. Um, and personally, for me, I'm just curious uh, about the world. So I've been learning, you know, um, building Occam has led me into uh, very deeply into uh, cryptographic protocols. I started a, a cryptography meetup. In fact, just two hours ago, we had a meetup about multi-party comp computation where a PhD student uh, in cryptography presented how you could run a function uh, between two parties without revealing the inputs of the function, but you only reveal the outputs of the function. So for example, uh, John and I could compare um, if I have more pieces of, if let's say both of us have a bunch of pencils sitting on our desk, we could re we could compare whether he has more pencils or I have more pencils without revealing how many pencils each of us have, right? So it could be mm -hmm. five or 10. The output that's revealed is I have more pencils, uh, but whether it's five pencils or 10 pencils or 20 pencils, that part is not revealed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is obviously a made up example, but you could apply it to some real world scenarios where you could reveal, you know, the, the real world use case the presenter was talking about was um, comparing two people's salaries without revealing the actual salary and saying who's getting paid more without actually mm -hmm. revealing the actual amount. So there's some really cool cryptographic use cases. But essentially, what IoT has done, uh, or this Occam project has done for me is exposed me to uh, this deep side of cryptography where there's mm -hmm. lots of very cool tools to learn. Absolutely. Well, those are really important problems to be solving. So I think it's kind of, it's been fun to watch your your evolution to all of this, you know, from where, from where I, I've known you for a long time now. And you know, you were, you were a classic SAP mentor back in the heyday and, you know, you found your way into some really fascinating stuff and, you know, stuff that I think is, you know, technically fairly difficult, but I think it's really important too. I mean, you know, the, like, I mean, we didn't talk about all the security headlines in this area, but, you know, pretty much every day there's another one if you go out and dig for it. So really important, really yeah, important. Yeah. And, you know, like, like we said in the beginning of the episode, the digitization of physical things is not stopping. People are still doing it because they see value in it, right? Yeah. Um, we could do it the bad way and then suffer from a bunch of pain in a few years, which uh, already is exasperating, right? You know, it's the IoT attacks from four or five years ago started with just becoming part of a botnet. And then a few years later, they became ransomware related. And then a few years later, like, uh, you know, like last year, there was the Triton malware, mm -hmm. which which is essentially attacking safety critical systems like grids and chemical plants, energy grids and chemical plants, right. and it's blocking their safety procedures, right? So the escalating threat is happening and adoption is also happening. So, you know, it's intuitive to assume that this will get, this will lead to some really bad stories in the future. Um, so, um, so it, uh, you know, we can just let that happen, or we can we can build tools that make it so that those kinds of things don't happen, and we have better systems. Very well said. That's a good note for us to end on. But I am going to work in this final comment, uh, final question: Could the police use this to create speed cameras that are more efficient? Uh, and he says, uh, "I recently got a speeding ticket and thought, wow, this could have been so much worse if I was in charge of the technical side of cameras." For photography quality, et cetera. I assume the answer to that question is basically yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, sure they basically there's a lot more that they could do there. And uh, I think vision is a really complicated area, right? There's this, um, there's obviously a lot of cameras permeating everywhere uh, around us, right? And 
uh, how that those systems are built. It is, I think it's on the designers of the systems to build those systems correctly. Um, this police example is an interesting one. I, I always give the, the doorbell example. The contract of a doorbell is I buy a connector doorbell. The contract they sold me, like the, 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 you know, the, the expectation they sold me was I can see who's at my door, right? But the reality is they can see who's at everybody's door on my street. And that's not a right. good ethical system designer that built that system, right? That right. ethical system designers need to build systems that serve their customers uh, the right way. So I think vision's a really interesting, challenging problem space. And I hope more people will go towards the more ethical, serve my actual customer line than, you know, um, the Orwellian uh, surveillance uh, situation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I actually have a related article on that coming out on Diginomica next week, and I totally agree with you. And um, and I think there there is this sense in which uh, we buy a lot of devices and we participate in a lot of systems where we're not really told exactly how much access to our data they have. I mean, I think about like some of the smart devices I have in my home. Um, I'm not going to say their names. So I don't want to start talking to me right now, but, uh, but you know, I found out over time just how much they're intruding upon me and how much they're recording and listening. And, you know, it, it, it was not, it was something that I would have been a lot happier if I'd known up front rather than like going in and having to lock certain things down and turn certain features off. And, and, and to your point, there's an ethics and design here. And, you know, ideally that will be honored because then we can have a legitimate conversation about this technology, making our life better instead of having to revert back to this Orwellian discussion all the time, uh, which unfortunately seems to be prevalent so often. So, but that's a whole nother, uh, program. And I think we've, we've done our time today. So, uh, it was a real pleasure talking with you. It always is. I thought you really uh you really framed this nicely. So it was really, really fun today. Thank you. Thank you. It was it was amazing. And thanks everyone for joining. That was awesome. Uh, absolutely. Yep. Glad you managed to make it too. We'll catch you again soon. I'm hoping to do uh one more next week before I take a break for a week or two for the holidays. Uh, so hopefully I'll have something next week. I'm not sure yet what it's gonna be yet. So I still got a little work to do there. Thanks everyone. Catch you next time. Thank you, Ron. Bye.